Hello and welcome to the Tucson Bitcoin Podcast. Man, this is a fun episode today. I've got on three of the authors from the book, Thank God for Bitcoin. Um, I have Jordan Bush, Gabe Higgins, and Derek Waltchak. And yeah, it was an awesome conversation. Uh, just to you know, clarify, if you're watching the video, Derek had a little bit of connection issues and then had to uh, leave early, but he definitely offered a lot of really good stuff to the podcast. But yeah, um, yeah, it, it's just, you know, it, it's really a terrific conversation uh, because, uh, you know, what they're essentially doing in the book is uh, examining uh, money from a moral standpoint built on top of you know christian principles and I, I just think it's such a good way to communicate uh with a large portion of the population that you know might not see the importance of bitcoin um but yeah i mean one of the things that we talked about is that there's a coming storm financially and it's looking really dark and really rough and bitcoin is kind of like a life raft or uh, you know the example we used was uh, noah's ark and uh you know a lot of people are already getting destroyed by the current monetary system and a lot more people have no idea how much worse it can and will get um so you know i think books like this are really important because they speak a language uh that a lot of people hear and um yeah anyways it was a very compelling conversation and i hope you enjoy it well, we're recording. Welcome, guys, to the podcast. Good to have you on. Thanks for doing this. Um, I was, I don't know, it feels kind of like we're in end time. So having you all here kind of confirms that the rapture hasn't happened yet. So um, let's hope. <laughs> I didn't get the memo, so. <laughs> Maybe happening later today. Maybe. <laughs> With all the National Guard maybe, troops. Maybe in Thursday. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> hey, oh, man. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Um, well, uh, could you guys go around and just give a brief introduction of who you are? And um, maybe that's a good way to get started. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll go Take first. Poor Gabe. <laughs> um, I'm Gabe Higgins. Uh, I am a co author of uh, thank god for bitcoin i uh, met these guys uh, when we formed a uh kind of like a christian book club uh it's kind of how it started um and then it led us to diving into writing our own uh thesis on why bitcoin fixes all the problems of fiat uh, monetary systems so uh it's good to be here my name is Jordan Bush. I'm a missionary church planter living in Latin America, Uruguay. Um, moved here about six years ago to start a church. And somewhere along the way, I was trying to figure out, you know, yeah, somehow I came across Bitcoin and then just that started a process that led to meeting all these guys. And yeah, just realizing how, yeah, just how the world is broken and how Bitcoin does is a great tool towards, you know, fixing it. So. Awesome. And uh, I'm Derek Walchuk, live in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, got hooked up with these guys when Jimmy Song reached out and said, hey, putting together a Bible study with uh, other Bitcoiners from around the world. Are you interested? And I was like, of course. And uh, so jumped in. We went through a couple of books um, that were that was looking at sound money. Um, what were the title of those books, guys? Never the remember. ethics of money production mm -hmm. and honest money. Yeah. And uh, so we read those books and, you know, thought there's more here to flesh out and especially around Bitcoin. And then we're like, let's write our own book. Um, and that's what we did. So that's why we're here. Yeah, I love it. Um, I uh, also have uh, the ethics of money production sitting on my desk right now. Uh, Stephen Cole recommended it to me a couple weeks ago and that's i think that's one of the things that's just like a bummer with hanging out with bitcoiners is that there's so many good book suggestions like i i, I don't know I, I it really drives me crazy because i'm backlogged i've got like six in my 
on my list right now that I'm reading. Um, but yeah, thank God for Bitcoin was totally. Thank God for Bitcoin was definitely like really enjoyable because um, it was pretty short and concise and uh, very very well written. And um, so yeah, I mean we we talked a little bit about recording. I started the recording, but what was it like uh, co-authoring a book with eight authors? It was a lot more enjoyable than you might think, honestly. I mean, it was, I mean, again, doing this all remotely, like that was another, um, another part of this whole thing was this, we started this in, what was it? We started actually working on the book, I think around June, June or July. And so this was all during the pandemic. This is all done remotely. Um, and Jimmy, Jimmy basically had helped write the little Bitcoin book. He had done it in a similar way, but um, in their case, they had all physically gotten together in a house and just, you know, for, I think it was two weeks, they just kind of, you know, busted it out. In our case, it was a little bit more complicated, um, just given that we were all in different places, but even still, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed the process. It was some, it was a lot of fun. Um, we come from a lot of different, um, faith background, I mean, just mm -hmm. different parts of Christianity. And so like that introduced, you know, certain, I mean, just certain challenges, but like not really anything too crazy. Um, there was no knockdown drag out fights. That's another benefit of doing this remotely. You just, there's no way you can just put your hands around somebody and, <laughs> and grab them. So anyhow, we, we really enjoyed it. Um, I think, yeah, having a lot of perspectives um, was helpful. Um, yeah, just trying to figure out how to communicate things to different audiences. You know, we have different perspectives and different people who we interact with more frequently. Um, and so, you know, one of us would raise something and, you know, we wanted to present something a certain way. And then somebody else would say, hey, I'm thinking about people from this background. Maybe they wouldn't understand that or maybe they, um, I don't know, that wouldn't be helpful. And so that it was helpful for us to, to kind of have each other's perspective, I think. Yeah, this is uh, like, this is my first, I think, uh, for you guys too, I, this is my first even endeavor trying to write a, a book. Um, so I'm super glad that we had uh, people that had already done something like this before. And uh, this was really led by Jimmy's guidance uh, with the whole process, uh, which was really interesting process. Uh, you know, when we first started to try to even figure out we didn't know what the book was going to be about at first so we it, we had a massive brainstorming session where we just did a a brain dump on a bunch of concepts bunch of ideas bunch of topics um and then it, it kind of like coalesced and formulated uh what what we have so uh, it was a very very interesting process um and and it was enjoyable i, I had a, a lot of fun uh putting putting this together with these guys yeah, specifically what we did is we basically, once we got the, the concept, we each wrote a chapter. Um, and then we then took another week to pass the chapter essentially to the, the person to the right and then kept going until we every one of us had edited everyone else's chapter. And we had full permission to tear it up, throw it away, start fresh, you know, basically edit it like you would edit your own. Um, I think that took a couple weeks to kind of fully like, okay, can I really <laughs> cut four <laughs> pages of this, you know? Um, and then, you know, he would eventually uh, do that. Um, and, uh, yeah, and it, yeah, it took a long time. Um, you do have to sort of, I think, I'm curious if you guys felt this, like, um, sometimes I struggle working in a group cause I'm like, I have the idea and I just want to do it. I'm just, that's the kind of personality God gave me. Um, but with a group, you know, you really kind of have to figure out your role. And then towards the end, it started getting real smooth, you know? Yeah, guys. Yeah, no, you def we definitely found our groove uh, towards the latter half of the process because um, it was, I mean, this was new to all of us, obviously. So um, it, it, it took a little bit of getting used to uh, kind of understanding like the, the format, the rules uh, that, we, that we laid out uh, beforehand and kind of working through the process was, was in and of itself uh, kind of, it, it, uh, it took a little bit to get used to. I do think, I do think one of the things that helped us though was, I mean, just the, I mean, the mission behind the book, I think, I think that like that helped clarify and unify us um, because I mean, all of us have seen and experienced, I mean, just in different ways, the, 
yeah, just the, the potential and, and the power of, of Bitcoin. And then also seeing, just understanding the, the, moral, the moral case for Bitcoin. I mean, all of us had experienced it and understood it some way personally. And then kind of the more that we all worked and kind of saw each other's, you know, different specific points that we brought to, to the argument, um, it really just brought a sense of, um, I mean, there, there was just a gravity to it as well. And so I think that was, you know, it, it was just a fun thing. I mean, it felt kind of, I mean, I'm a Lord of the Rings nerd. Like, I mean, just like, you know, you have the company, like we were the company of the, of the Thank God for Bitcoin book. I think it, it was just a really fun process, enjoyable process. I mean, also, again, you've got people who have been in the space for a lot longer, um, you know, just who throughout the process, you, we just, I, my respect, I mean, grew immensely for them with time. You know, sometimes they, they talk about like, don't, don't meet your heroes, you know, because I mean, just they're, they can be just really jerks in person. And that just wasn't the case at all. Um, you know, regardless of how much, how much or how little success, you know, um, different members of the group had, I mean, I just am so thankful to be able to have, you know, spent time and just seen, you know, who these guys are. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's something that I've been really amazed with uh, since I started podcasting, um, meeting all these different prominent Bitcoiners and how just down to earth and uh, real they are. And I think part of the reason why it's like that is we're still so early in this. And uh, um, I hope that doesn't change. And I don't know if it will, but I've just I've just been amazed by how helpful people are in the space. And I think, you know, kind of going to what you guys were talking about, that common mission of like, you know, really bringing, uh, uh, you know, hope to a lot of people that have been devastated by the, the monetary system we're in right now. It's just so um, uh, exhilarating and, and meaningful. Um, but yeah, what, for, for, so far, like for the reception of the book, have any churches uh, really reached out to you guys and, and uh, uh, welcomed the book at all? Or is that, how's that driven any discussion in the Christian community on a larger scale? I think, um, yeah, we released the book. How, how long ago guys? It was like 30 days ago. Yeah. Or so it's just, it was just right before Christmas there. before mm -hmm. Christmas. Yeah. 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 So I, I, as far as churches, I don't know if we've heard bits and pieces about folks who, you know, I'm ordering 10 for my pastor and blah, blah, blah. Um, but we're just now in the process of trying to approach the church community through some, some Christian podcasts and things like that. So I think we're figuring out where can we, I mean, I think within the Bitcoin community, you know, a lot of people know about this book, a lot of podcasts about it, but actually trying to enter, you know, the Christian podcast publishing, all that stuff. Uh, we're working our way to get inroads into that community. So I wouldn't say we've, penetrated five percent of it yet but that's our plan this year yeah definitely i we're, we're getting a lot of positive feedback um <laughs> online um our our reviews on amazon uh are growing and they all remain very very positive uh in, in the five star range i think we've received only one four star so far um so uh and, and a lot of it is you know how, how this has really uh, encouraged a lot of a lot of the folk out there to uh, approach their church body um, with this concept uh, because it, it can be it can be intimidating um, to talk about this uh, just because of the perception of Bitcoin that it's have the negative perce perception of Bitcoin um, that it's had over the years through the media. Um, so you have to overcome that and then talk about, oh, no, actually, this is this is a, a very positive thing, especially for uh, faith based communities. And here's why. And it, the argument, of course, is as we lay out in the book is uh, because it, it fixes a lot of the things that the current uh, fiat system ha has entrenched um, themselves in and a lot of it negatively impacts uh the church bodies and i'm not even sure they're aware of it and the, to the yeah. extent that um it's da it's been damaging to the church body so i think that's what's really helping 
um, other believers get the courage to uh, start uh, taking this topic on and approaching their uh, church leaders. One, one thing that I was going to say is, um, like, to, to Gabe's point, one of the things, I mean, one of the things that Jesus said when he came, he said, you know, those who are, those who, those who are well have no need of a physician. And so basically the idea is like, if you don't, if you don't know that you have a problem, you're not going to look for a solution. And so I think that's, that, that's exactly where, to Gabe's point, it's exactly what's happening with, with most people, including most Christians, is that they don't understand the problem itself. And so they're not looking for, you know, for a solution to the problem. And so I mean, again, that, that was the, one of our main motivations in writing the book is just that when you understand, um, when you understand what's happening and why, like you should be morally outraged and it should, you know, prompt you to, you know, to talk about it and, um, and look for ways to, to opt out of that kind of system. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that, again, that's what motivated the book. Um, and I think, again, I think it's just going to take time because it is, it is, I mean, there's, there's baggage to the topic of money itself. Um, there's baggage to, like, again, like Gabe said, there's baggage with Bitcoin in general. Um, and so, like I said, I, my, the, the, the route that I've taken to, in, in trying to talk to people about it, the, the temptation is to go straight to, you know, number grow up and, you know, like, look, look how well this is doing. Like, look at this, look at the success, it's, it's the success that it's having, but that's just not, it's not the argument that, that resonates with most people. Most people, the, the argument that resonates is this is what's happening, you know, with the U S dollar, you know, the, the actual rate of inflation is closer to 15%. You're losing, you know, your, your buying power, you know, going through those kind of things. Um, generally they, they're more helpful in, in creating a need and demonstrating the need that's there. Yeah, that, that's definitely what got me into Bitcoin uh, was seeing, uh, you know, and reading the Bitcoin standard and seeing the way that the way that money works um, really impacts society and influences people's decisions and choices. And, you know, what it's interesting because the church is actually what started me down uh, the path of, uh, you know, financial wellness was, uh, you know, I started with Dave Ramsey and uh, awesome. awesome. Um, and uh, that was pushed by, you know, the pastor of the church that I was attending at the time. And uh, they really uh, had really good resources. So I think, I think the church's um, role in this is really important um, because a lot of people, you know, view the church as like, you know, their community of, uh, and support and, uh, you know, where they go to like really grow and learn together with people. And so I think, you know, Bitcoin being that, um, thing that really like changes the ball game for people to protect their wealth and you know etc um but yeah I, I um jordan does your church uh in uruguay uh do you guys use bitcoin in any capacity so so no uh, like this church basically the church we're at i mean there are when it's 50 people at this point it's very very small and about half of the church is made up of venezuelan immigrants and so, I mean, that, that's been, that was another thing that, I mean, why this resonated so much with me when I, I mean, the last you know, two years, year and a half that I've you know, really gone down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, part of it was motivated because I'm seeing and experiencing and helping people who've been directly impacted by, you know, money printing and by, you know, like the, a few step there are a few far, a few steps farther down the road than the United States is. But it, it's clear to me that like, we're not far away, you know, in the West, in the United States, we're not far away from this on the exact same path. Um, and then as well, Uruguay is right across the river from Argentina, which in the last three years, I mean, Argentina, the buying power, um, just in dollars between, Arge no, between the Uruguayan peso and Argentine peso has lost 15 X its value. And so, I mean, it's just, it's unreal. And so now one of the things that we have, we have been doing is on a very small scale is just trying to set aside, you know, some, some money in Bitcoin to be able to help, you know, you know, people who are in, um, you know, who are refugees, you know, Venezuelan refugees specifically, um, that, that is something, but again, that's, it's a very small scale on, on a day-to-day -day basis. There's, there's no real, you know, up to this point, there's been, you know, it's not an active part of our, our ministry to people. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting and, and compelling. Um, and I think, uh, 
you know, from like a human rights standpoint and the ability that Bitcoin has to, to help people who face, you know, one of the things like we, we hear the headlines about um, hyperinflation in other countries, um, but there's a lot less that is, uh, you know, reported on general public doesn't see, you know, the capital controls that go along with it and the government policy that like just decimates people because, you know, if the currency starts failing, the default is to go into dollars um, or, or like a stable currency. You know, some people use Bitcoin, but, you know, we're really early um, in this regard. But, uh, you know, and then, you know, the government comes in and, and places rules on, you know, what you can and can't do with the currency, how much you can withdraw from the banks, um, essentially yeah. eliminating, you know, any ability for these people to, you know, escape with any sort of, uh, you know, wealth, you know, it's just destroyed, um, you know, whereas Bitcoin, you know, you could just load it on your hardware wallet and uh, run for the border and, you know, you've got all your, your wealth there for you. It's, it's, it's or, a pretty uh, big. And memorize Alex. It, yeah. Memorize a 12 year, a 12 word seed phrase and you're good to go. I mean, it's. Yeah. yeah and Alex, I think you're exactly right um, in that you know, you're, you're describing the world as is right now and the, you know, kind of dismal state of a lot of countries and people with their currencies. Unfortunately, uh, looking ahead over the next five to 15 years, I think it gets a lot, lot worse. Um, I was doing some research over the past couple of weeks on kind of where global central banks are on their digital currency rollouts. And um, it's, it's a, I think it's a much quicker timeline than most people expect. Uh, there was a survey uh, that was put out in December by the Bank of International Settlements of central banks worldwide. And 20, let's see, 20 of the central banks, um, they, the, the group of central banks thinks that 20% of them will have launched their uh, will have launched their digital currencies by 2025. And you know, if you think about how uh, digital currencies work. You either can do a distributed system like Bitcoin, where you know the essentially the ledger is everywhere and on everyone's computer. There's no central person, or you do a digital currency through a central clearinghouse, which is un, un you know undoubtedly will be what central banks do. Um, and essentially, when you start walking towards that cashless future, um, you completely lose anonymity uh, when you eliminate cash. And apart from something like a non-sovereign currency like Bitcoin or, or others even, you know, but certainly we believe in Bitcoin, um, your ability to be free and to be private, you know, say in 10 and 20 years in the future will be, you know, non-existent, you know, and maybe the United States won't be that bad with it, but, but you guarantee, I guarantee you that countries like China, et cetera, um, you know, that not only will you, you know, you'd have to deal in a black market, but you won't even have a currency to be able to deal in a black market apart from Bitcoin. I just think that the need for that as a, as a cause for freedom is just bigger and bigger as we, we go into the future. Yeah, I, I'm definitely like wondering if my days as a content creator are numbered uh, because of this heavy censorship that we're seeing, you know, with uh, they're going after podcasts now and that differ. I, I am not part of the red versus blue battle in, in the slightest. I try to be um, you know, liberty focused, human rights focused, uh, um, you know, very, which, which, you know, those, those standpoints, you, if you're being honest with yourself ha, are not, um, congruent with the whole red versus blue battle. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, <laughs> it's just crazy, you know, to think about like, you know, not only can they censor the content that you create, uh, from the internet, but they can financially censor you, you know, so it's like, uh, you know, they don't like what this church is doing. Now they can like just close their bank account and freeze all payments to them. They can already do that, but it just, you know, lags up or um, increases the likelihood of and, and the ease to do something like that. So yeah, the CBDCs honestly, are terrifying. Yeah, no, it is. It is. I mean, and I, I think that's, I mean, Again, it's hard to it's hard to figure out like how much this helps, you know. But I do think it's I mean the censorship is going to drive people to Bitcoin, right? Like it's gonna drive, it's gonna be another, you know, latch point that's gonna 
another value prop that, that people were going to appreciate. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I hope that's one of the effects that it's going to have. I mean, again, like one of the things that is tempting within the Bitcoin space is, I mean, is the focus on the price and, and the focus on, you know, I'm going to be a gazillionaire someday. But I mean, I just think like just realistically, I mean, you're just, I don't, I don't have the expectation that if you're holding a couple, you know, a few Bitcoin, like you're going to necessarily get rich. I, I, I mean, I hope, I mean, it could happen. I just think the potential via central bank digital currency, the potential for, I mean, like poverty and, and I mean, it just suffering and, and, you know, all kinds of different things. I think it's just so high that I just feel like, I mean, Bitcoin, Bitcoin might just be, you know, something that, allows you to opt out of that and, and protect yourself more than it does make you some kind of millionaire. Um, so again, it just depends. Nobody, nobody knows, you know, like there's people working on the game theory and again, I hope they're, I hope the, the more optimistic ones are right. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's tough when you're, yeah. When you look at the global scale right now, it is, it's a, it's a tough thing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think one of the, the drawbacks of living in the United States is we're going to be um, a little bit slower to seeing the importance of something like this than, you know, what you're describing in Venezuela and Uruguay, because um, we've had relative, uh, you know, financial stability. And, you know, in a city like Tucson, we've got a very low cost of living, which allows people to get away with not being very financially uh fit in the slightest and you know it's we're hitting a point where it's just you know we're gonna like i i i've been seeing some memes of bitcoin being like noah's ark you know and if you look at the story of noah like you know he was shouting and screaming and people didn't listen to them and the flood came and you know it sucked um and everybody thought he's crazy but uh i mean hopefully you know things will not be that dramatic but I think the unfortunate reality is they are likely to. Um, yeah, so, yeah. No, it's, it's a perfect analogy for our, our book and what we hope to do with it is, is help kind of like uh, rattle some people awake um, to what is happening and help them see that there is uh, a flood coming, if you will, um, of epic proportions in regards to um, the effects of a very loose uh, monetary policy that uh, the United States have been has been engaging in um, for a couple decades now, but especially uh, in the past uh, decade or so, um, it's it's and, and definitely uh, you know the next administration is not uh, look, looking to be any better or wiser. Um, to uh, to the same kind of policy um, and the same kind of um, uh, looseness in their <laughs> yeah exactly uh, in their in their fiscal ways. So um, you know I, I think the book is very timely in that uh, aspect as well. And um, you know to the specific uh, group that we're trying to reach uh, and bring this message because there's been a lot of confusion uh, around Bitcoin. And, you know, there, some will go as far as to uh, think of Bitcoin as like, like it is like the mark of the beast um, or something like that, uh, which we touch on in the book and, and try to refute as best as we can. Um, and, and why, of course, we, we do not take that position. We do not hold that position at all. Uh, we think it's quite the opposite. And that's literally why we are thanking God for Bitcoin is because it's Noah's Ark. It's not the market of the beast. Yeah, there's no question. If you look at, you know, what a, what a mark of the beast could be uh, in the current environment, you know, what could it be if you look at a central bank digital currency, that's pretty much it. If that's, you know, if, if all dollar bills go away um, and you only can use the digital dollar and you have hardware wallets on your phone, um, and that's basically the only kind of currency that you could take. I mean, that is a complete opt-in with controls. Um, you know, the 
yeah, Bitcoin is just an option um, that would be to circumvent uh, a, a one world currency or a, you know, a, a currency that's um, run by governments. Yeah, I think, you know, speaking to people um, that really believe in like the American uh, framing of government and around around uh, people consenting to government that the idea of like the central bank digital like fiat money is already kind of the destruction of that because uh, government can expand uh, as much as they wish to um, they can uh, pay for anything that they want without explicitly taxing people um, which kind of gives people the power to to say no to a certain degree um, and uh, uh, next thing in the evolution of uh, oh gosh of just tyrannical control of like people have no say and no power anymore and it's um horrifying to imagine you know like i'm I'm seeing articles now you know where germany is uh having covid camps you know where if they deem somebody a risk to public health they they put people in the camps and you know we know from history that generally doesn't go very well um you know, they're talking about doing that in New York. Um, I, I saw something that the CDC has that that plan on. And, you know, we, you know, if, if you're completely relying on the government, you know, for everything, you know, financially, um, uh, you know, if they're the ones like paying you to exist and like, if you do something that they don't like, you know, and they just pull the rug from under your feet, then you know, what do you, what can you really do, but just comply and consent to just awful things. Um, And it drives me crazy, but yeah. Yeah. And I think that is, I I do think, and I think that some, like one, one aspect that I think it's talked about some within the Bitcoin community is just the, the importance of the, the social, you know, and, and personal aspect to it, you know, because like, again, like there, there's many people within, you know, the Bitcoin community who are motivated strictly by money, like they're motivated strictly by number go up. And so in that sense, they're honestly, like they're honestly is little difference between them and what motivated the central bankers, you know, who institute the situation, the, you know, the situation that we're in right now. And so I think, I mean, this is where, I mean, this is where st- the, the moral arguments that, you know, we bring up in this book and there's other people who've done work on it as well. Uh, but just the moral arguments are so powerful and so important to make um, because, I mean, you can, yeah, you can, you can make lots of money, but live in a miserable place. <laughs> you know, Like you can, you can make lots of money off of the backs of people. And so, I mean, just so much of, yeah, I mean, the, the reason, and this brings, it's, it's really important to come back to like, why does money exist? You know, like why, like why does money exist in the first place? Money exists in the first place because the primary thing that we valued on a human level was, is loving your neighbor. You know, we, we go into this into the book that, you know, money exists as a tool to help you to, to love and serve your neighbor in the way that you want to be loved, you know, and served. Um, and so it, it's a way to, to protect and honor the work that your neighbor has done. Um, and, the same, and you want that because you want people to treat you that way. And so what, what happens, what has happened in our current system is, you know, that like what money is, was actually changed. And so like the money that we have is not, like it does not fulfill the purposes that money was designed, you know, to, to fulfill. And so our current money is doing exactly what it was designed to do. Like it, it, it puts money in the pockets of, of, you know, politicians and central bankers who are, you know, at the, you know, at the point of money creation, and it over time robs from normal people. And so, I mean, I, I just think we, we have to keep that in, in, in view. And, and again, this is another thing is, we have to be willing to endure hardship, be like to that end. Like we have to be willing to, and this is, I mean, why, why has the Christian church been able to, you know, endure so many things that it's endured for 2000 years? It's because they were willing to suffer for the things that they believed in. Um, and so I, I think that, I mean, I think in everyone's estimation, there's going to be some cost. Um, there will be a cost at some point to how committed are you to loving and serving and protecting the buying power of your neighbor, 
versus just going along with, you know, governments that threaten you um, if you don't, you know, allow them to, to live in the delusion that you can reap where you haven't sown. Um, and so I, I think, honestly, that's, that point is coming. And um, I think that, yeah, it, w- the, the question at the end of the day is, are we willing to stand up and, and do what's right, even if it costs us? Um, so. Yeah, we're, you know, to a certain degree seeing religious persecution right now. And, and, you know, in the, the context of like the grander scheme, it's, it's hardly what we're seeing globally, but, you know, for the churches to be shut down, which is unconstitutional, it's against the First Amendment, um, uh, first and foremost, but, you know, we're watching in New York, you know, where Cuomo is going to war with the Hasidic Jewish community, um, you know, really like demonizing these people. And uh, I mean, religious expression is, is very important for people, you know, it's their communities, it, it's, you know, a huge part of, you know, what they rely on, and you just take a bunch of people and isolate them and, you know, essentially demonize them for wanting to express their, you know, faith and spirituality. It's, it, it's not great. And I know there's a public health crisis happening right now, and I don't want to discount that. Um, but, you know, what we're seeing is, the reach of government's power, you know, and what they can do and how they can do it without any accountability and uh, the way that they just crush dissent. Um, and it's, you know, a bad precedence to be um, setting for sure. And, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very dangerous, I would say, uh, that that they're able to subvert uh not just i mean not just our uh ability to gather um and worship as we see fit but um i mean but it shouldn't surprise us if they're able to do that with the money that we use uh then they can extend that out to breach other aspects of our lives as well and so again this is a just another touch point that we make in the book is where um, we, we have to break that cycle and Bitcoin actually does enable uh, churches to to completely separate themselves um, you know a lot of people like to talk about separating church and state uh, but what we're talking about here is uh, separating uh, the money and state which is uh, more important um, and it helps ch- separate the church from uh, the state uh, and not the other way around so I I, I think these are key concepts uh, that I think uh, you know today's modern Christian haven't really thought about in a long time uh, and it's and it's led to a degradation in how these uh, you know faith communities, uh, function at, at a like fundamental level and so we're trying to hopefully encourage people to think about these issues in a more deeper uh, level and actually act upon them and and there's a way to do that and we hopefully lay out uh, the reasons and the ways to be able to do that and um, and we hope that that it ends up benefiting these communities uh, in a in a way that we haven't seen in a long time. Yeah, one of the things that I mean, just on a very practical level, like, that Christ calls you know Christians to be is to be salt and light. And so part of like that's part of what this this book is designed to do. It's part of what Bitcoin just does is it shines light on darkness. You know, it shines light on darkness and and you know things done in the dark, done secretly that benefit an increasingly small group of people at the expense of everyone else. And so, and then to the point about salt, I mean, Christians are designed to be salt, which is a preserving agent. And so like, this is, I mean, this is the danger, right? Like this is the the danger of what's happened. And because as, as more money is printed, as money is, you know, removed from any kind of backstop um, with time, people are forced to work more and more hours in order to, you know, produce the same amount of value for their, for their families. 
And so over time, what you have is you have more and more time being spent by parents. More Parents have to spend more and more time working and less time training and teaching and, and helping to form their children's, you know, their, their own personal character and then also their view of the world and, and all these things. And so like over the last 50 years that, the, you know, there has been no peg. I mean, you have entire generations who, you know, haven't, they haven't been raised by their parents in the same way that, you know, has been, has happened throughout the majority of human history. And so what that happens is that, that backstop and that, um, that, um, like, um, immune system, if you want to think about it like that, like parents are, are, you know, are supposed to be kind of help their children to develop an immune system to avoid evil and, and pursue good. And the fact that parents have had to work so much more has, has, has harmed that. And so I think that this is, I mean, what we're talking about is, is very practical. It's very, um, it has a lot of, it has a, a lot of a, a wide effect on people. You know, if your money is increasing in value over time, you're going to be able to spend more time with your family. You're not going to have to act as though money is the most important thing um, because money is not the most important thing. Um, and so it, it helps to put, and we talk about this in the book, it helps to put Bitcoin um, and deflationary currencies help to put money back in, in the place that it's, it was designed you know, to occupy so that other things, namely loving your neighbor, you know, and, and like obviously from our perspective, like loving God, like so that those things can, can retake you know, center stage um, in, in people's lives. And that, that produces human flourishing. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I really like that. I, that's one of the messages I try and like drive in on the podcast is like personal responsibility means like taking ownership, not just for your own life, but for your community. And we've, I, I've seen like a, a complete, uh, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people really stepping away from that, you know, because they're, we're, we're become so federalized and, you know, we look to the government as being like, the ones that really have control and it's like a life or death uh mission to you know get our guy into office at the expense of you know the other people and um it it's a distraction you know and when you have money um and you have the ability to have stability and uh uh really uh dedicate time to you know, the fixing the problems that are in our community. I mean, there's just so many solutions. The education in Tucson sucks. It's like awful. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, what, you know, I want to do is supplement that, you know, give kids education. Like the, the um, city council is very unfriendly towards businesses. So, you know, we live in an increasingly remote world, you know, so if kids can learn how to, you know, do basic computer stuff, you know, they're, their possibilities are endless and you don't need to ask for permission. You can go freelance on Fiverr, or, you know, um, do graphic design or, you know, coding or, you know, stuff that like just isn't being offered. And like, those are like real solutions that are not that hard to, you know, offer, but they're only possible. Like if you have the ability to, um, you know, have what you're talking about, that, that basic foundation to be able to have the time and energy to give back and, yeah, I think that's huge. Um, could so like say the church were to adopt Bitcoin, you know, how would you see um, how would you see things change? Um, like what practically, like what would that look like, and and uh, how would that impact the church? Yeah, well, yeah, let me find this real quick. Yeah, one of the things again, like this is Bitcoin fixes a lot of things, but it's it's not a panacea. Like this is. Like the, the, let me just find this quote. I had like this epiphany the other day <laughs> of like, uh, just like something I'd been trying to articulate for a long time. Um, what is it? I mean, it's just basically, yeah, like Bitcoin fixes a lot of things, but it doesn't fix what motivates people. You know, like it, it can help, you know, that to a certain degree, but it doesn't ultimately, it, it's not going to make you love people. This is what I, this is this quote. So, just the idea that Bitcoin redeems money by removing the ability to expand the money supply from the hands of men. Okay, this is what Bitcoin does that, that no other money at this point does. But the gospel redeems men by removing the desire to expand the money supply from the hearts of men. You know, and so like this is, so like this is what's, 
this is the crucial difference that is, is especially for Christians. I mean, again, again, I know there's so many people who don't buy into that who aren't Christians, and that's again, I can't do anything about that. But like the the point, the point of the gospel is that God comes in, like he he comes and he changes what you want. Like he gives you new desires to, to, to love and serve others and not just serve yourself. And so I do think this character, I mean, art, the character of people and, and I mean, something that the church focuses on, I, th I think that the church has, has great potential to, I mean, the church is doing awesome work to that end. Um, and so one of the things that I think that Bitcoin can do is it can give them, I mean, it verifies their, their worldview to a tremendous degree. Um, and I do think that this will, it'll, it, it's a, at least for me, it's, it's only purified and sobered my understanding of, of what I was alive to do anyhow. And so I think that, I mean, one of the things that we talk about is one of the things, one of the consequences of a, of a Bitcoin standard would be it's, we will remove the world from a debt-based money. Like the entire system is based on debt slavery that again, in the short term benefits people, but is also crippling when you're looking at things from the standpoint of marriages and families, you know, who are, who are devastated by the consequences of debt. And so, um, again, another, another aspect is just the, the appreciation for work. Um, you know, in a, in a deflationary system, you, in order to have money, you have to produce, like you work in order to produce value. You can't get a loan you know, ahead of time to, you know, to do that. And so I think one of the things is that is again, helpful for shaping character. Like it, it, it forces you to invest of yourself, you know, physically through either, you know, or mentally, whatever it is, like you have to give of yourself in order to get something like that. That's an incredibly valuable and, and healthy um, and, and real view of, of how the world works. Um, you know, we live in a world that has sowing and reaping, you know, we don't, we don't get fruit first and then plant, <laughs> you know, and then plant seeds later. No, you have to plant seeds in order to, you know, in order to, to benefit from them later at a later time. And so we live in a deflationary world. We live in a world that has, that operates by the, the principle of sowing and reaping. Our current monetary system completely denies all of that. And so we're going, it's going to be a, a more healthy, sustainable, you know, uh, sustainable world that it, assuming that the world increasingly adopts a Bitcoin standard. Yeah. One of, one of the things that we like to, the concepts that we like to uh, really hone in on is uh, having a longer time preference for things, meaning you're thinking and acting uh, in a, in a long-term uh, perspective. Uh, whereas right now, um, just like Jordan is saying, is with a with an inflationary uh, fiat monetary system, everything's based on a short time frame. You're you're wanting things on demand. Uh, you want things here and now. You want that. You want to purchase that house and that bow and the and all the things right now, now, now. And so you're you're borrowing against your own work, uh, your future work. Um, at a rate of return that you'll never be able to escape out of that debt hole that you bury yourself in. And so thinking in a longer term time preference with a, with a deflationary sy monetary system uh, like Bitcoin enables means that you work now and you benefit later, right? And maybe it's a couple years later, you know, maybe you don't get that thing now but uh, you're able to save for your future, unlike the current system. I mean, there, there's no way to save in our current system. If, if nobody's noticed, um, you're not getting any yield on your bank deposits. Uh, it's, it's, it's driven down on purpose by the Fed, <clears throat> and they're continuing to inflate at a rate that, they've, that we've never seen before in history. So uh, it's very important for people to understand that. And it's very important for people to realize that their wealth is not, you're not even benefiting from that short term uh, time preference that the Fed is having because they're printing the money now and they're able to capitalize on, on the value of that money printing now, whereas you're not able to. And they're actually robbing from you and from your future work and potentially your 
your children's uh, future as well. So uh, having a longer time preference, is, it, it, it flips your value perspective on its head and helps you evaluate things on a, on a, on a completely different basis. And, and that will help you be able to plan for your future uh, a lot better. And this creates more stable communities. So just like Jordan is saying, this is this will help uh, create stable environments and uh, flourishing uh, human uh, production as well. Yeah, children children are a low time preference investment. You know, <laughs> yeah. like children yeah. like children are low time. If you're if you're sitting here forced to, if you're forced to live on a hamster wheel, you're choosing to buy into you know a system that tries to put you on a hamster wheel to get you immediately debt enslaved with $80,000 worth of you know, student loan debt from the moment you turn 18. I mean, like you're, you're setting yourself up into a, into a future. I mean, it's, it's just morally irresponsible and reprehensible, honestly, to that, that that's the system. But again, up until, up until the creation of Bitcoin, I mean, there weren't, there weren't scarce assets readily available to, to normal people, you know, like most people, I mean, their home became a store of value, but there's many people who couldn't, who can't afford a home. They're forced to rent. And so then again, they're just losing, you know, with every passing year, they're, they're getting, you know, they're being worse and worse off. And so where like Bitcoin, I mean, one of the, my favorite things about it is just that it's, it's this scarce asset that our Venezuelan friends who, you know, who don't have anything, they can buy $1 worth of, of, a, of a, you know, scarce asset that can't be inflated. And so it's, it's, it's having this, you know, equalizing effect amongst, it's giving equal access. It's a just system. You know, it's giving equal access to, um, to scarce assets between the rich and the poor. Obviously, like you're never going to eliminate poverty. This will not happen. Um, and so th that, there, will always, there will always be the necessity for people to, to be generous and, and serve, the, you know, those who are, you know, less fortunate, fortunate than themselves. But this system is fundamentally designed to, to create wealth inequality. And so it's, it's fundamentally designed in factoring in human sacrifice. Like, like this is, I had this epiphany the other day, I'm like working on this piece. And like just the, the reality that the current system sacrifices human, like it sacrifices human work for the good of, you know, for the good of, of, of a group of small central bankers and uh, in politicians, and who, to what end? What are they doing? They're literally like they're worshiping money. So you have human sacrifice to worship a false god. Like that—that's essentially the like the reality of what the system is. And so, I mean, I think that like we, I mean, all of our laws are built around the idea that humans have more value than that humans have more value than than or that humans are of greater priority than money. Like any, I mean, theft, why is theft wrong? Because it says that, you know, stealing, getting this money and betraying some, getting money is more important than, you know, honoring this person, than not, you know, than betraying their trust. You know, why is human trafficking wrong? Because it says that getting money and getting, you know, sex is more important than whatever happens to this person in the meantime. You know, why, why are Ponzi schemes wrong? Because they say that it's more important to have money than it is to, to treat people honestly and fairly. So we have these principles, you know, that we, where we acknowledge that humans are more important than money. And yet the system that exists completely operates, you know, alternative and in, in, in against those ideas. And so all, all Bitcoin and all like we're saying is this is, this is wrong and it's unsustainable. It's doomed to fail. It's failed everywhere else. It's been tried. Like, you know, we, we can't continue down this road. We don't, we're not going to, and so again, this is another thing where this, another parallel between Bitcoin and, and the gospel, how is it that the gospel spread? You know, Paul and, and the disciples didn't march up to, to the palaces and, you know, the, the kings of, you know, the Roman Caesar and the, and the king of, you know, Israel, they, they didn't believe and then, you know, mandated to everyone else. It started from the ground up. It started from these people who were thought of as being fools. You know, they were preaching this message that, I mean, just what in the world are these guys even talking about? And then over time, it, it, this decentralized spread of the truth, you know, worked its way up and infiltrated. Um, and so Bitcoin it is having, you know, a very similar effect. So I think that there is, you know, B Bitcoin is, is loving 
Bitcoin takes care of people. And so as a result, people like, trust and, and increasingly turn to Bitcoin. Whereas governments are trying to force people to trust them, force people to obey them. And no one trusts governments. <laughs> And so I think that we're, we're sowing good seeds. This, like, there's, there's great hope. You know, at the same time, there's all these dangers. I think there's, there's reason to, to be very encouraged. Yeah, I think that's great. And uh, wow. Yeah, a lot, to, a lot to think and chew on in those last couple uh, comments. But yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. How, how, how do we go about orange pilling Dave Ramsey? <laughs> yeah um i not sh- not sure i mean I, if somebody can get him our book i would uh i would be interested to hear his feedback on his take um you know of course he's on his show he's talked about bitcoin several times with some of his listeners and hasn't spoken too f- fondly of it um as an investment vehicle now, uh, which is you know primarily what he deals with right on his show uh but our argument here isn't you know getting into bitcoin from an investment perspective that's not what we're we're saying at all uh we're saying that bitcoin reevaluate re it, it, it helps you reevaluate what it means to invest your human capital and your 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 own time and energy and what you value in the first place so uh it's a it's a different take um than anything else you've you know that that we've seen we haven't seen this particular kind of uh argument being made which is why we felt it was very important uh, uh, uh to us and how it comports to our uh our principles and in, in our faith as well but um you know primarily how this affects you and how you value your own time and other people's time and uh, and how you can prevent that time from being uh, taken from you uh, without your knowledge or consent. Yeah, I think one of the things, I mean, again, I appreciate Dave Ramsey all day long. I mean, like Dave Ramsey's, what's motivating Dave Ramsey and telling people to stay away from Bitcoin is because he had he his whole audience, many of his audience are people who have looked for getting rich quick schemes and have fallen prey to them and gone deep into debt as a result. So I, I'm I'm totally respect and understand his his I mean his, the position that he takes up to this point on Bitcoin. I don't begrudge him that at all. It makes sense. Now, again, what I would love to see is someone to to present again the moral side of the argument, you know, to to Dave Ramsey. Um, because I do think there's, there's lots of substance there that he, that he would agree with. Um, I just think, again, he, he's, I mean, the guy's gone bankrupt multiple times. I mean, like he's, he, he's seen get rich quick schemes and, and he's trying to help people avoid those. Um, and so again, I, I appreciate that. I, I hope that, um, I hope that he does get you know, orange pilled at some point. Uh, there's, there's people who are in a better position to, to kind of, to, who might have his ear. I'm, I'm hoping like there's gotta be Bitcoiners who are around him. I, I just feel like there, there has to be some people. And if they're not now, hopefully, you know, in the next year or so, when, you know, if what happens with, you know, Bitcoin's price happens um, while, you know, in the, in the context of, you know, governments continuing to print trillions of dollars, you know, hopefully that'll be something that, you know, he becomes, you know, more, more open to more sympathetic to. Yeah, I think it's a it's a matter of time for him to just uh, come across it from a logical um, standpoint of like there's not a whole lot of other options out there to preserve your wealth. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean his model of like uh, you know being cash first on everything prior to debt is something that's I think kind of breaking. Um, at this point, I mean, it's, it's good to have savings, but you know, cash savings are worthless. So it's, yeah. So, um, as far as, uh, you know, the book goes, where, where do you guys suggest, uh, finding it? Yeah, well, we, we have uh, a couple different websites that are now carrying the book. Um, obviously we're on Amazon. Uh, you can find that there probably the easiest. Uh, and if you do have it to buy it, through there we would um uh like to ask if you could definitely leave some feedback 
uh, as a uh, for a review uh, that helps that helps uh, get the word out through the um, Amazon algorithms and stuff um, but also uh, a website from one of our founders Bitcoin is dot com uh, carries the book uh, at a slightly lower price as well so if you want to and you can purchase it with Bitcoin um, so if you want to save some some of that money uh, you can definitely go there and order that book yeah I had a um, Brian Harrington was on the podcast a few days ago and he suggested that website too so I'll have to go and yeah so Brian was a part of our original reading group, so he he took part of the uh, the first iteration of, of what this group was. Uh, he didn't stick around for the writing the book part though. Uh, but <laughs> maybe we'll get him on the next the sequel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so and the the book is available. I mean, we've talked about this, but the book is available in Kindle and paperback formats right now. Um, we are super close to having an audio, having the audio book um, format ready to roll. It's we got we submitted it the other day, I think, and we're just waiting to hear back. Um, and then yeah, and then we're looking to do like a an evergreen series of podcasts, just basically taking it I mean, taking the book one chapter at a time, just for people who are more interested in you know going a little bit deeper or just kind of I don't know if we're gonna we, we haven't exactly decided how we're gonna do it either if we're gonna go into maybe. Uh, some of the process behind some of the decisions that we talked about, decisions that we made, stuff to include or not include. And we haven't really narrowed down what we're going to do, but um, yeah. Yeah. Who, who narrated the audio? Yeah, uh, so, George yeah. McCall, one of our um, co-authors. Gotcha. I was, uh, I was spamming Jimmy trying to get him to have Guy Swan narrate it, but um. <laughs> yeah, guy, guy, reached out, guy reached out to us within I think the very first day the book was published and he said hey do you guys have an audiobook yet <laughs> and we're like oh yeah like we're, we're working on it right now yeah that's awesome I'm looking for I, I I love audiobooks because I can't give them away like I can physical books so I'm looking forward yeah. to um, that <laughs> well cool where, where are some good places that people can follow your guys's work yeah, uh, probably Twitter is the best. You can follow me. I have two uh, Twitter handles. Uh, crypto Edge is my main. Crypto underscore Edge is my main um, Bitcoin uh, uh, Twitter handle. Uh, but also you can find me at Gabe B. Higgins on Twitter as well. And then my Twitter handle is um, at J.M. Bush writes. W I W R I T E S, and then I have got a a blog that is very near to launch, but I am I am not the uh, most handy blogger, and so I'm like a couple days away. But and that's going to be, yeah, I actually I'm using one of the the uh, rejected titles for the book, which is um, it's going to be merebitcoin.com, <laughs> drawing uh, hijacking uh, the old classic C S Lewis book. So that should hoping to have it up within the next week and a half. So, yeah, C.S. Lewis is the best. Um, I'll do a plug for Derek. So he hosts the uh, Broker Lord podcast, um, and uh, his Twitter is D Waltchak. So all these guys are definitely yeah, worth following. One other quick shout out, just we want to, I always try to do it, just shout out to the other authors of the book. So Jimmy Song, we've already mentioned, Robert Breedlove, um, Julia Turiansky, um, who else am I forgetting? And George McKeel, we already talked about him. Those are the other guys. Oh, and Lyle, Lyle, Lyle Pratt um, is also, again, awesome, awesome people putting out awesome content, both on Twitter and YouTube. So go find them as well. Yeah, one of the first things I did was go and get all, when I got the book, was go and uh, follow all you guys. And it was yeah. definitely a net positive for me, for sure. And cool. and Jordan, keep on seeing you in uh, Clubhouse Room. So that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah, Clubhouse, man, I think it's, it's fun. Yeah, Clubhouse is the place to be. If anybody needs invites, reach out to me. Um, but yeah, well, I really appreciate you guys coming on. And this is a lot of fun. 
This is a really fun conversation, and I think at the same time, it is an incredibly important conversation. So, you know, if you are a part of a Christian community and you found this conversation helpful, or if you know people that you're friends with and are Christian and you're a believer in Bitcoin, uh, you know, I think it'd be awesome if you could share this with them and and definitely check out the book. I mean, it's it's just written in a language that uh, people you know, might not hear. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a hardcore Bitcoin evangelist. I, I try and get out there and, you know, educate so many people about it because, you know, it's like Jordan said, you know, if you understood the monetary system and what was really at play here, you would be absolutely outright outraged. And I am, you know, I'm tired of seeing my community just be preyed on by fiat money. And, you know, it, it's just progressing to a, a place of, you know, just disgusting uh, and crazy overreach, you know, and it's going to only progress that way. Like, you know, exactly how Derek said, the central banks around the world are usurping so much power, um, not only by printing money, but, you know, working on having a digital currency that they can control, you know, and like cash is different from digital currencies. In cash, you can, you know, hold your money and you can transact privacy and, you know, do all these things and that are really fundamentally important and uh, do not just only facilitate crime like the central bankers are now uh, suggesting. Um, And you take that away and there's just no accountability anymore. They can just censor any transaction that they want to. And it's a very uh, scary, scary feature that is... um, possibly ahead for us and i you know we have an ability to to shape that and i think that's a really thing important thing you know that i want people to understand is that we have tools that we can push back and if we don't push back it's just going to happen this way um so yeah anyways uh these guys are great definitely give them a follow on twitter uh and uh yeah it really really big thank you for um to Derek and Jordan and uh, Gabe for coming on. Hope you have a good one.